Christianity is the world's most easily falsifiable religion. Probably not what you expected to hear this morning. <laughs> I don't mean that, that it is false. I mean, it's the easiest to prove false if you're going to. It's unique as far as world religions go. It makes claims that no other religion makes. Of course, the beliefs are, are different, but there are also claims that it makes because no other religion begins the way that Christianity does. Hinduism is a variety of Indian cultures that over time became fused together into one philosophy. Uh, Islam began when one guy said he had visions from God and he drummed up support. Mormonism started when a guy said that an angel visited him, visited him and gave him special tablets that only he could read. Scientology started when a science fiction author wrote a new book and put it in the wrong section. <laughs> but Christianity begins with a very specific claim that Jesus of Nazareth has risen from the dead. So proving it false would be rather straightforward. You find the body of Jesus of Nazareth, and we're done here. I get to sleep in on Sundays. <laughs> and trying to prove it false, you're not competing with someone else's spiritual experience that you can't really speak to. You're not arguing about someone's dream or someone else's vision or culture. All you had to do was produce a body. If you could just produce the body of Jesus, the whole thing never gets off the ground. It never starts. If you could even just prove that the body went missing for other reasons, that would probably be good enough to at least slow it down. But no one ever did. And so the question this morning is, is it true or is the whole thing smoke and mirrors? In Luke chapter 24, Luke writes, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And when they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they found the stone rolled away, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words and returning to the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. What we're discussing here today is a historical event. It's no different than the commemoration of signing the Declaration of Independence on July 4th. 1776. Today we're celebrating something that happened April 9th, AD 30. Now the death of Jesus of Nazareth is certain. That happened April 7th, AD 30. He was crucified by the Romans at the behest of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. The records we have <clears throat> historically of what happened to just the average person during a crucifixion and what specifically happened to Jesus leave no doubt that he died that day. Modern medicine has actually helped us make sense of some of the more difficult to understand things about the crucifixion. For instance, Jesus is said to have sweated blood at one point. And you might read that and think, well, that sounds a little bit fantastical. But not only is that not possible, we've seen evidence of it today and we have a name for it. It's called hematidrosis. And what, it happen, what happens is when you have a certain, just incredibly high amount of psychological stress, you can burst the capillaries in your sweat glands. And when you do that, the sweat that comes out of them is tinged with blood. It's not a lot of blood, but it's enough that is visible. Then when Jesus is stabbed in the heart with a spear, 
it records that blood and water came out of him. You think about the water part, that that sounds kind of strange as well. But the amount of blood loss between the beating before the crucifixion and the crucifixion itself would cause a condition called hypervolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock. Hypo meaning low, vol meaning volume, and emic meaning blood. You go into shock because you've lost so much blood. And when that happens, <coughs> the area around the heart and the area around the lungs fills with fluid. And when it comes out, it would look clear like water. There's no room for any other possibility than that Jesus of Nazareth died that day in April, 1,986 years ago. That has not stopped people from attempting to dispute this. One such theory is the swoon theory that says Jesus didn't die on the cross, he just fainted. Then, in the cool air of the tomb, he woke up and felt refreshed and then went out and appeared to everyone and they thought he had risen from the dead. Now, there's a number of problems with that. For one, the Romans were really good at what they did. If they were going to kill you, you were going to die. Also, we're talking about someone that's just been flogged and crucified, has the strength to move a stone that weighs about as much as a small car. And it's not like you could just push it straight forward. I don't know if you're aware, but you often see depictions of the stone in front of Jesus' tomb, and it seems impossibly round. Well, that's kind of what it was. It fit into a track and a groove in front of the tomb. And so this isn't push out. This is somehow get this thing to roll sideways uphill over a rock that had been put in place to keep it there. I'm spending too much time on this. This is completely preposterous. It also doesn't take into account that when everyone saw him, they described him as vibrant and victorious. If, by some chance, he survives this, and you see him two days later, he's going to look like he needs medical attention right away. I slipped going down the stairs a couple weeks ago, and I'm still limping, all right? <laughs> Any ideas that Jesus did not die on that day are unfounded. It is a matter of history. It happened. The other theory that attacks this comes from Islam. It says, well, it wasn't really Jesus that died. It was someone else that God made look exactly like Jesus in this miracle. And that person died, and then Jesus just hid and then popped back out and said he had risen from the dead. Now, keep in mind, we're talking, the Quran was written 600 years after the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. We think about it as an old, old religion, but 600 years is a lot of time. That's three times far as removed as we are from the founding fathers, right? And so, put it this way, if I wrote a book, cited no other evidence, and said that George Washington was a lizard person, no one would believe me, rightfully so. There's no historian, Christian, or otherwise that takes these arguments seriously. It is a matter of fact that Jesus of Nazareth died crucified by the Romans, April 7th, A.D. 30. Now, we also know that the tomb of Jesus was empty because we have reliable accounts of it. We're given the name of the individual who buries him. That person is a member of the very same council that sentences him to death, which makes his inclusion in the writings incredibly trustworthy. Because why else would you include this guy that seems like he has every reason to not be there. We're also given accounts of Jews claiming that Christians stole the body from the tomb, which only makes sense if there's no body in the tomb. Not only was Jesus buried in a tomb on April 7th, that tomb was found empty on April 9th. Again, the Jews accused Christians of stealing the body, but did they? Well, it's highly unlikely. For one, their stories read far too much like eyewitness testimony. People like to point out, well, there's little discrepancies in the passion accounts and the Gospels that makes it seem like they don't all jive together, which is true. And that actually points to them all being historical, because they all agree about the broad strokes. They'll name different people that maybe saw him first. Well, if we all saw the same event, we would all have very similar tales about it, but 
you might say, well, the car that smashed into the other car out there, it was going about 30 miles an hour, and I might say 35. I might say, you might say, oh, it was going under the speed limit. Or so we would say similar things in different ways. Well, it points to this being historical. It's real. They also mention that women are the first eyewitnesses to the empty tomb, which you would not do back then if you're trying to get someone to believe you. In that culture, both the Jews and the Romans dismissed the testimony of women in court. It's thought to be untrustworthy. Can't trust you women. <laughs> so your testimony doesn't count. So if you're writing something and you're trying to get people to believe it, you do not have women be the primary witnesses. It's completely counterproductive. The disciples were also willing to be tortured and killed over this claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. If they made this up, the whole thing, if they stole the body and they knew that he was, then you don't be tortured and killed for that belief. You can convince someone else to die for your lie if you're convincing enough. But no one's going to be tortured and killed for their own lie. When all you have to do to save your skin is say, yeah, you know what, I made it up, sorry. You do that. But they don't. The disciples don't. His mother and brothers worship him as God. Let me just ask you, what would you have to do to convince your brother or parents that you are God? Right? <laughs> now, the empty tomb alone is not proof of the resurrection of Jesus. You also have to see him. And in the case of Jesus, we have over 500 people that claim to have seen him after the fact. Paul writes a letter to the church in Corinth, and it's one of the earliest documents we have in the New Testament. It's only written about 20 years after the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. And in that letter, he recites a creed of the early church. And this is what they've been saying from the beginning. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So everything after the colon, here's the creed that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Why does Paul do this? And you look at the Luke account that we read, it mentions every single woman, like, here's this person, the mother, here's this person, the why do you do that? Well, in ancient writing, you do that because it's like your version of footnotes. If you don't believe me, go ask them. And so Paul, in a document that's meant to be read in public, says, well, we know that Jesus is risen from the dead. He appeared to the disciples and the apostles, me last of all. He appeared to over 500 people. If you don't believe me, go ask them. They'll tell you all about it. Go find James. Go find Peter. Go find some of these 500 other men that saw it and ask them what they saw. The tomb was empty on April 9th, AD 30, and hundreds claimed to have seen him raised. This is a fact. And there happens to be a thing that goes along when we talk about the resurrection that C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. It's this idea that we think, well, they were ancient people and they weren't as sophisticated as us. They didn't have the scientific method. They believed all kinds of wacky stuff. They thought everything was witchcraft and superstition. So, of course, they believed in the resurrection. Problem is, that doesn't really do justice to the reality. It was unthinkable to both the Jews and the Romans that an individual would be raised from the dead. They both had different reasons for that and different reasons from us, but they both had reasons why they thought that was preposterous. The Jews, for instance, they believed in a one-time resurrection of everyone and everything. So if you told them, oh, well, this person was raised from the dead, they would say, oh, really? Was well, the lion laying down with the lamb? The Lord has come and established his kingdom? Get out of here. That hasn't happened, so that didn't happen either. They wouldn't believe it. The Romans, they believed that the physical world was corrupt, that it was evil. Death was sweet release from this dirty physical form. 
So to the Romans, not only did they not believe that you could be resurrected from the dead, they had no conception of why you would want to be in the first place. Why come back to this? You win. No one back then had a category for this. As a pastor from Atlanta once said, nobody expected nobody. It's also important to know that the Jews were decidedly monotheistic, that they believed in one God, and that was it. And so to claim that a human being was God was blasphemy. Blasphemy is punishable by death, by stoning. So if you claim one person is God, this human being, you would be stoned to death. And that's exactly what we see in Acts when Stephen starts preaching. And he proclaims Jesus is God. They kill him for it. They don't just kill him because they're upset. And they don't like what he's saying. They kill him because the law requires them to stone a blasphemer to death. That's what they think he's doing. And this is important because both of these worldviews change virtually overnight. That's not the way the philosophies are born. Normally they take a long time where everybody sort of believes this and then someone comes out with a wacky idea over here. And that sort of redefines the center, right? And people start realigning along. And it sort of, it doesn't maybe ever get all the way out to this guy, but it sort of moves everybody over a little bit. This takes place over decades, over centuries. The new worldviews are de built and developed like this. We have overnight a group of Jews that are boldly proclaiming that a man has been raised from the dead and that he is God. This is an underrated proof of the resurrection because if you don't believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, explain that. It's a lot harder than you think. And so the following are the facts of this event. And by that, I mean they are agreed upon by all historians. Both Christian historians, historians that are not Christians, everybody agrees on this. They, there's some quibbling on the date. Some people say AD 30, some people say AD 33. That's about as much disagreement as you'll get about what the following. Historically speaking, this is true. On April 7th, AD 30, Jesus of Nazareth was killed by the Romans. He was crucified in Jerusalem. At no point in history... Up to this point, did anyone expect an individual to rise from the dead? The tomb he was buried in was found empty, and after April 9th, AD 30, a group of Jews began proclaiming that Jesus of Nazareth had risen from the dead, was God, had talked to them, touched them, and ate with them. That is all true. The likeliest explanation for those facts, to me, is that Jesus rose from the dead. If you got a better one, there's a lot of secular historians that would love to hear it. Geza Vermes is a leading scholar. He's written a lot about Jesus in the church. He does not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He does not believe in God or miracles. He thought Jesus was a pretty neat guy and he had some good things to say, but he leaves it about there. And he wrote this book that takes an extensive look at the resurrection. He goes over the historical claims that we've covered here so far. He would agree with that set of facts that I just laid out in total. So how does he explain it? Well, first he goes through and completely tears apart all of the other explanations. All of the explanations of Jesus not dying, all the explanations of the empty tomb that, we've, that anyone's ever given. He tears them apart and shows how they don't work at all. And then he gets to where, okay, well then here he's going to give his explanation. And he punts. He goes, well, miracles don't happen, so it couldn't have been the resurrection. Maybe someday we'll figure it out. That's it. Now, N.T. Wright is a Christian scholar. He wrote the preeminent book on the resurrection of Jesus. It's a giant 740-page book. It weighs two and a half pounds, and that's the paperback. Thank the Lord for my digital copy, right? He concludes at the end of the penultimate chapter the following. He says, historical argument alone cannot force anyone to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. But historical argument is remarkably good at clearing away the undergrowth behind which skepticisms of various sorts have been hiding. The proposal that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead possesses unrivaled power to explain the historical data at the heart of early Christianity. 
we've talked about the historical merits of the resurrection today, not because they're sufficient in and of their own, not, but because I think we need to be aware of them. There are too many Christians walking around thinking that they believe what they believe and it's just blind faith. Well, no, there's very good historical reasons for you to believe what you believe. Faith, after all, is just another word for confidence. It does us well to revisit the fact that what happened, happened. And that should energize us, that should charge us as we think about the resurrection, that this happened. That doesn't mean that concluding, looking at the historical data and concluding, well, yeah, Jesus probably rose from the dead, that that is enough for faith, that that you're saved and boom, you're done, no more there. There was a verse that we recently came across in my small group that I don't think I'd ever seen before. I've probably read this dozens of times. And I just would always go right past it. It never really hit home to me. But this happens in the end of Matthew, very last chapter towards the end. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. So Jesus has risen from the dead. He tells them, go to this mountain in Galilee. They make the trek up to Galilee. They go to the mountain. Watch what this says. And then when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Wait, what? (laughs) They literally saw the resurrected Jesus. And some of them went, I don't know about that. How does that happen? I mean, how is that possible? And so if they're able to still doubt after seeing it, then us looking at it through history, of course, this isn't enough just looking at history. But this is why when some people say, well, if God would just do a miracle right in front of me, well, then I'd believe in him and I'd serve him. No, you wouldn't. Because if you don't believe now, you wouldn't then. That's, in fact, the same answer that Jesus gives people. That, give us a sign. He goes, no, if you haven't believed the prophets and everything else I've done, There's nothing I can do that's going to change your mind. And so if Jesus, as we've demonstrated so far, if he did rise from the dead, what does that mean? The implications of this are endless. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he is who he says he is, which raises the question, well, who did Jesus say he is? Well, in John chapter 8, He's talking to the Jews. He says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. What does that mean? Why does Jesus say, so saying, your ancestor Abraham, hundreds, thousands of years ago, he was excited to see when I would arrive on the scene. And they go, well, how do you know? You're not even 50. How have you met Abraham? And he doesn't say before Abraham was, I was. He says before Abraham, I am. Which is a callback. It's a reference to something in Isaiah where he's saying, I am God. By using that little phrase, I am, the way that he does here, he's making a claim to be God. And you know that the Jews get the message because the first thing they do is pick up rocks to stone him to death. And so if Jesus rose from the dead, then he is who he says he is, and he claims to be God. Also in John's Gospel, he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So Jesus is the source of life. He's the one that grants life and grants access to that life, and he's the one that sustains that life. One of my favorite passages from Paul, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, says, about Jesus, and he is before all things, like Abraham before everything, and in him all things hold together. We sing a song here every now and then called Center that says you hold everything together. This is where that comes from, that he is life and the sustainer of life. If Jesus rose from the dead, he is who he says he is. He says he's God. He says he is the giver and sustainer of life. He also says, In John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way to God. There is no other way, no other name. There is no other path. There is just 
Jesus. Now, how rude of him to say that. We live in a society where it's not polite to make exclusive claims like that, that there's only one way to God. Jesus did not get this memo. (laughs) He doesn't say there's plenty of equally valid paths to God. Pick the one that you want. He doesn't say that all religions basically teach the same thing, so you just pick one and you'll get there. He says, no, it is my way or the highway. I am the way. I am truth. I decide what is true. Your true, your, the truth is not subjective. It's not up for debate. It's what I say it is. And I am the life. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he is God. He is the giver and sustainer of life. And he is the only way to access that life. If Jesus rose from the dead, then the Bible is what Jesus says it is. What did Jesus say about the Bible? Well, in Matthew chapter 22, he, says, how, he said to them, How is it that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet? The important part here is, how is it then that David in the Spirit Jesus says that the Bible is inspired by God. That David's not writing something that he just thought of, that this isn't good advice. He's writing in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking through him as he's writing the song in Psalms. Think about it like a musician. I'm not a big Kenny G fan, uh, but he's, he plays a wind instrument, so this works, Right? He plays the saxophone. When he does, what makes the music? The sax or Kenny G? It's kind of a weird question if you think about it. Like, well, who's making the music? Well, it's Kenny is breathing into the saxophone and he's working the keys of the saxophone. And then the instrument produces the noise, which I suppose is more what I would call Kenny G's music. But Kidding. <laughs> I didn't know we had so many Kenny G fans in here. I'm very sorry. But this is how Jesus views the Bible that the Holy Spirit breathes into these individuals and they write inspired by him the things that he's laid on them to write. And this is exactly how Paul ends up describing Scripture. In 2 Timothy, he calls it, literally, God-breathed. And so we think of the Bible as the inspired Word of God for one reason today. You ask Christians, well, why do you believe in the Bible? There's only one reason why I believe in the Bible. Jesus believed in the Bible. He rose from the dead. I'm going to go with him. In Matthew chapter 4, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus viewed the Bible as authoritative. He was tempted, and what is his response? To quote Scripture. He believed it came from God, and he believed it was trustworthy, and he believed that it should be followed and obeyed. He also believed it to be necessary, right? We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You don't grow without Scripture. because You can't just live by eating the physical. You've got to also eat the Word of God. How do I know that? Well, so Jesus thought. And then in Luke, after the account that we've read in chapter 24, it says this, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What happens here? Well, two men are walking down the road, and they're talking about everything that's happened. Jesus, here they think he's the Messiah, and now he's dead. And then the tomb's empty. There's this crazy stuff going on. So these two guys are walking down the road and they're talking about all of this. 
And Jesus appears to them, but he doesn't let them know who he is. He says he hides his identity from them. And he goes, so what are you guys talking about? Like, did you not hear? Like, this is the talk of the town. There's this Jesus guy. He was this great teacher. He did all these mighty works and stuff. We thought he was the Messiah, but then they killed him. So he couldn't have been the Messiah. But then they went to the tomb, and the tomb was empty, and we don't know what any of that means. And Jesus is like, well, you guys don't believe that? Really? You don't believe that he had actually risen from the dead like he said he was going to? Kind of prods them, and then he does this. It's the beginning with Moses and the prophets. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Because the entirety of scripture is about Jesus. We sometimes make the mistake of thinking it's about us. It's not. It's about him. There's a pastor from the UK, Andrew Wilson, who writes in one of his books that one of the unique things about being a pastor is that lots of people have pictures of him in their homes because he does a lot of weddings. And so when the photographer captures the first kiss or whatever, there he is in the background. Now, he's not under any delusion that they put the picture up because it's a picture of him. He's not the focus of the picture. He's there in the background. That's kind of like what the Bible is. We're there. We're in the picture. But don't get it twisted. It's about Jesus. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he is God as he said he was. He is the only way to God as he says he is. He is the one who inspired the Bible as he said he did. And he is the point of Scripture as he said he is. And if Jesus rose from the dead, then we need what he said we need. John 3.16 is a verse that many people are familiar with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We need to believe in him. Without believing in him, we are not given life. We perish. We perish because of our sin. The Apostle Paul spells it out this way. He says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus. That all of us are in need of a Savior, and that can only be Jesus. And so you are given two options. You believe in Him and live, or you don't, and you perish. There is no third option that Jesus ever ever gives. Either we believe in Him or we don't. In John 14, He says, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments, and I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus also defines that believing in him looks a lot like obeying him. That we can know that we've put our faith in him and we believe when his commandments become things that we lovingly want to follow that we want to do the things that he's called us and asked us to do. But Jesus also knew that we couldn't do that on our own. After all, that's the whole reason that he comes and dies, is that no one could hold up the whole law. So he does. And he comes and he is perfect and is sinless, and then he dies in our place to save us. And so he promises the Holy Spirit to us to live in us and be around us and help us to obey these commandments, to live them out. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he is God. We're called to put our faith in him and back that up with obedience and to live and grow off the word of God. That is what he said. And if he rose from the dead, I'm inclined to believe him. See, the message of the resurrection is much bigger than one guy defeating death. The message of the resurrection, Easter means that we're not here by accident. That the whole world isn't just some cosmic coincidence. That there's a purpose and a plan for this world and for us all. That there's meaning to be found here. 
that we can search and we can find only in Him. The good and evil are real and we can call them out as they are. Easter means that life is more than just stuff. The doing more, acquiring more, having more isn't all we're here for. Easter means that this world matters. Also in Luke chapter 24, Jesus appears to the disciples and in a very serious spiritual passage, He says, you got anything to eat? And they give Him fish. And He eats the fish. Why is that in the Bible? Why is it... We don't celebrate that as part of Holy Week. Like, oh yes, and then the holy eating of the fish and chips. Like, that's not... (laughs) We don't do that. Maybe we should do fish instead of ham today. I don't know. It's in the Bible because Jesus comes back in the flesh. He doesn't come back as ghost Jesus. He doesn't come back in some spiritual... We try to... Oh, it's very spiritual. It is, but He comes back in the flesh. He comes back human. They could touch Him. He's eating their food. In one of the other Gospels, he cooks breakfast. And so that means that everything around us matters. That things like helping the poor, things like caring for the environment, fighting disease, they matter because they matter to God. Because this world matters to God. Easter means that the church matters, that the gathering of God's people to worship Him is important to Him, and it's important for us. That when we open the Bible like this together, and the Holy Spirit ministers to us through His Word, that we need that. We're not dusting off some old, dead book written by old, dead men. We're opening up the Word of God and allowing it to penetrate our hearts. Easter means that God is alive and well. That He's active and working in the world today. That He desires to know you and be known by you. Easter means that He loves you. And so if you're sitting there and maybe you've never formally put your faith in Jesus before, that's something you can do today. There's no special prayers or anything. No special ritual to this. It's pretty straightforward. It's you believe that Jesus is God, that He was risen from the dead, and you admit that to people. And you try to live in a way that honors Him. That we live our lives to serve and obey Him. You do those things, and you begin this journey with Him. And if today you're sitting there and you've done that for the first time, I'd love to know about it. And if you're in, you know, intimidated or you want to get out of here or something, you don't want to talk to me, I get it. There's a, you can even just, on that connection card, there's a little box you can check that says that you've committed your life to Jesus today. You can just check that and drop it in the basket on the way out and we'll see it. See, Easter means that Jesus is risen. He is alive and we are free. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for all You've done for us. That we are not here celebrating some myth that we are not here to feel good about ourselves, that we're not wasting our time this morning, but that we are here to celebrate the risen, living God. Who has created everything, who sustains everything, and who has called us to know him and be known by him, that you're personal and involved. Lord, I pray that you would give us faith, give us confidence in you and your work. 
that we would respond to it, respond to what you've done with faith and love and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen.